Hi, I'm Joe Tolls. Growing up in the foster care system, working within it, and single-handedly raising eight teens adopted from the foster care system has given me a unique view into that world. My reputation for working to keep children connected, healthy, and happy with families who love them is important to me. Who I am today is a far cry from what my circumstances might have dictated. To start, I had to navigate my own childhood hurdles to become the athlete, father, and therapist I am today. Together with child advocate specialist, Renee Damon, and our guest. I will highlight the issues that impacted me on my journey, issues that are most likely impacting children and families today. Join us as we examine my first steps out of the starting blocks and into the race. Our guests for this episode are adoptive foster mother and family advocate, Danielle Skelly, and youth advisor and foster care alum, Guillermo Mijero. Bastard, someone whose parents never married, something that is inferior, or someone who people do not like. And the only part of that definition that factually applies to me is that my parents did not marry. Yet the other two parts of that definition have been emotionally absorbed into my DNA. So as a result, I've had to work extra hard to make sure the thing that makes me so uncomfortable in my own skin doesn't become the thing that defines me. You see, I was born and immediately placed in the foster care system. Although by design, foster care is supposed to be a temporary situation. For people like me, it can be a life sentence. The unintentional trauma permeating through that system is simply not temporary. Right now, there are approximately 400,000 children in the foster care system in the United States, and 117,000 are waiting to be adopted. And those numbers do not account for the children who are free to be adopted, but have given up on the institution that is supposed to be an entitlement of birth. Family. I, like many, have lived in several homes, have been threatened with unstable living conditions, endured episodes of physical and emotional abuse, had divorced parents, and even witnessed the attempted suicide of a parental figure. And none of those issues were any of the reasons I was placed in foster care. Those were all issues I experienced while in care, a system that no matter how hard they tried was never going to be able to offer me the stability that a child needs most. The system simply has no heartbeat and yet seeks to decide for, dictate to, and distribute all the precious heartbeats of those trapped inside. It often removes us from our families, our friends, our kinfolk. It deconstructs our identities until all you become is what the system has made you believe you are. Instead of love and security, it reinforces our new inheritance. Increased financial instability, increased housing instability, lack of consistent education, low self-esteem, identity issues, depression, anxiety, self-blame, guilt, feeling unwanted, a lack of hope, all because I didn't belong to someone. For those of you lucky enough to have a family, your potential for emotional health, high self-esteem, greater resilience, a well-defined identity, higher social competence, and the ability to handle stress is so much greater. When you know where you come from, and more importantly, when you know where you belong, your potential for growth is limitless. Luckily for me, my life's path crossed with a teacher and coach who took the time and effort to see me. He gave me messages contrary to those I was receiving at home, contrary to the messages from society, and certainly contrary to the messages that I was creating in my own mind. All I can say is that whatever fate was watching over me, it gave me the courage to believe in him. 
<laughs> and there it was. The shift from believing in no one, to believing in him, to believing in myself, because he believed in me. That lesson became clearer and clearer to me as I navigated my life's journey. And even though single, when the time was right and purposeful, it was my turn. It was too precious a gift to keep to myself, and so I opened my heart and opened my doors to my first baby boy, who had just turned 17. Xavier arrived, and all the things I knew I wanted as a child I saw live out in him. I was addicted, in love with love, and filled with the power of what hope provides. Jonathan arrived at 14, followed by Ronnie, who was 13. Then came Cremel, who was 20 and then Cameron, then Sincere, who were both 12, followed by John, and then Trenton, who were both 17. Eight young heartbeats released from the system that held them captive. Now they were free to belong to something that was uniquely theirs. We as strangers freely decided that we were more than the sum of our experiences, and what we needed more than anything was to be family. Now none of this erased any of our experiences, good or bad. And it hasn't always been easy, but we now know where we belong. We now know who we belong to, and we now know that this is forever. We also know that no law guardian, no foster care stipend, no independent living program, no judge, or no rotating caseworkers can take the place of the voices of the people who will always be there. People that will hold our hands no matter what, that will cry because they feel our pain, that will stay awake all night just hoping that we all are okay, will fight for you, will fight with you, tell you the truth, that love you. Family, and only family, is what saved us all. You know, Joe, I, I've known you quite some time and I've seen that video and I have not watched it in a long time and it still holds a punch for me in so many different aspects and so many different ways. How is it for you watching that? Well, each time I watch it, I, I, <laughs> I have to try not to cry because there's a lot of emotion and reality and it it's it's a reminder right it's a reminder of not just what not just loss but it's a reminder of of strength and i one of the things that i have a more difficult time to embrace is and recognize and keep present in my mind is my strength right so and i'm and I'm, i i i think there's a part of me that gets emotional because i'm proud of it i'm proud that i can do that and of course i talk about my kids and uh, ever since they started adopting kids i'm just like <laughs> I'm, I'm like i cry over everything so i, I have never cried so much until after after having kids but it's re it was really important for me to try to get in whatever way that i could and however long that video took to get the message out so that people i wanted people to i want people to understand i think the first thing that strikes me when i watched that video was like the beginning is like so much complexity of your life so much trauma so much stuff and, and such a simple solution. Family is the solution, right? And it's like, you have to go, They this complex system that screws stuff up all the time, like is designed to screw stuff up. The solution is so simple. 
and th- that that to me I think is what strikes me and and maybe it's because I, because I have a family and I have children and I and we've done this that like being a family is not hard like it's hard but it's really very simple all at the same time mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that's what struck me there is that you know the decision to be a parent it, to me is very simple you know and it, and it can have such a profound shift in trajectory for people i don't know i don't know that that's kind of what keeps resonating with me yeah i i wanted to say first of all an amazing video it's it's almost like you laid out steps that you took and it it, it was beautiful and I think one thing that really gave me that punch in the gut was this idea that there was this word that was limiting you, right? Bastard. And yeah, I mean, I, mean, I just, I, I was hoping maybe you could talk more on that. Like what, what exactly were the actions that you took to try to stray away from this label that you felt was constraining you? Well, it was more like what, what was the word? that I could use to describe the feelings, the actions, the, the, you know, what, you you know, I don't know that all of those emotions, all those things that the definition were is what I felt and that that happened to be, be encompassed in the word bastard. Mm. And so I don't know that I felt like a bastard, right? I just, it just, but, I, but it, but the word does fit in terms of the definitions in the, in the way that I felt about myself and the way that I thought society viewed me and certainly in the way that the system treated me. And outside of that, that, that label is the work that I think all of us do, more so kids that are in foster care kids that have been separated from their families or, you know, there's lots of issues that where people have to then try to find a way out, a way to themselves. You know, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest at all that only kids in foster care um, struggle with identity issues. Certainly it's obviously, it's obvious why that may be, but I think this applies to anybody who feels disenfranchised from their families or from their community. And there is, there is a way. So when I, you know, I took a path where I adopted kids. I, you know, it it was a long time and it was like waiting for magic, waiting for magic. Wait, I don't know what I was waiting for. At first it was going to be, I was going to married and then we'll have children. And, you know, and, and remember from the, prior episode, I was the one that wanted 12 kids, right? I remembered having 12 kids and that just wasn't happening the way that I, that I at least imagined it or dreamed it to happen. And, but I've also created family outside of that. Mm. I had to, right? So the answer is still family, but I have friends that are for long-term friends that are my family. I have <laughs> people that support me that are my family. So the pieces of support that I've adopted off of paper are my family. The people that I know that can call in the middle of the night, the people that are going to call me and see how I'm doing. So, you know, the trick is that each person's journey to that family is individual. And I can't tell people how to do that. I know how I did it for myself, but that may not work for you. And that may not work for Danielle. And that may not work for Renee. We have to create our, our support system the way so it's organically. Right. And sometimes, and not sometimes I'm really, the reason why I think we have people have a, an issue with that is because people that are disenfranchised have an aversion or fear of asking for help because that is a rejection if it's not given. 
And I think that once we, you know, for everybody out there, I think once we get over our inability, our fear, our, our anxiety about asking for help, the world opens up. And so, but, you know, sometimes that has to be through therapy. Sometimes it has to be a leap of faith. So, you know, again, that process is an individual process. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the video also, when I look back at it, also answered the question, right? Family was the action that you took. And, um, you, you like you said, you know, you, like you kind of did it your way and we have to find it our own way. I think I'm still kind of trying to find it, uh, my own way, but I think one big thing is that it, it's almost, it's almost like love, right? You can't, when you're trying to find it, it's, it's hard to find, right? But when you're just organically just living life, I think that's when things, special things like those come around. So yeah, thank you. No, you're, you're, you're welcome. It's the, the thing that I, that I like that I do is I, I, I have this ability to step aside and sort of watch the movie of my life. I don't know that people do that naturally, but I do. Like it's, 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 it's literally is like a movie to me. Like, like what, look, this is what happened. And, and, and it, within that, sometimes they get to be very introspective and can determine why things happened or what I was thinking about. But sometimes it's just not, it's just like, it just happens, you know, sort of when I retired, I, I am doing things that I never thought I would ever do, never dreamed I would be doing. And that's just organic and it's, it's very cool. But I, when I watch the movie, I say, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> so I still have, I still have an excitement or I still have an investment in myself, right? Yeah. I have an investment in who I am, where I'm going and what I'm doing. And, and, and I would say that for me, at least it's a conscious view. I am constantly thinking about how to make the world better, for instance how to make people's lives better. That's my jam. That's where I, that's where I live. And that is where I am the happiest. So that I've been able to identify that it makes life a whole lot easier. I love that. And I, I had another question. Since you say that bastard was kind of the word that, you know, it, 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 it's definition like closely, who's the closest, right? What would you say? would be the word now. Cause I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe it would be bastard now. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the post bastard stage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I don't know. I, I, you know, I, cause I was thinking about <clears throat> a word to, <clears throat> excuse me, a word to sort of encapsulate, encapsulate all of that. And I think I don't know because I think that it's still moving. Really? I'm I am still growing, I'm still learning. I am I'm a work in progress. That's not to say that those things don't still impact me because they do. And as we, you know, work our way through this podcast series, you'll you'll see that you know, I still have issues. You know, this is not who I am. This these four boxes is <laughs> Definitely not who I am. And I have my, I have issues and I would hope, you know, you guys would just laugh at me if I, if you, if I said I didn't, cause I do. <clears throat> so, but it's still, it's still a work in progress. I'm always, I'm always asking myself good, better and different experiences. What am I supposed to learn here? So I like that space for myself. I know that's a scary space for some people or a non-existent put space for some people, but I really like that space. There's just so many things that I think about, but like, I think of this idea of like love when you're looking for it, family, when you're looking for it. And I think it's because when you're looking for those things, you're defining them by a construct that's not yours, right? Because what family, what you need from a family or what you need from love is unique. And when we look for it, we're looking for, what the movie told me it was going to be or what a TV show told me it was going to be or right. Cause it, these are constructs created by some outside force. 
And when you're just kind of cruising through life, you have experiences and you're like, oh, that's what that is. That's what love feels like. That's what a family feels like. And and it might not be what a family feels like to me. It might not be what a family feels like to Joe, but that concept is sort of like solidified in your mind by an experience on some level, you know? And Joe asked me like how he was going to introduce me. And I, and I was trying to think of like, well, well, who, who am I like in this, in this setting? Right. And, and that always first and foremost, the word that comes to my mind is my mom, right? That that's in everything that I do, that's what comes out first is that I, you know, I mom everyone. I, I don't know how else to explain it. And I think that's also, you know, if you were to ask to define what a mom is, I don't know if it would be the definition that I embody, but in my mind, that's exactly what I am. It's the only word that I can find that sort of, that, that's what I do. I don't, I don't know what else to say, you know? Right. And, and I think that's the same idea of like family or love is that it, it changes based on the circumstance. And, you know, I had a unique experience of being part of Joe's growing family and I think back to when I got a phone call from a caseworker who had been intimately involved in Joe's first or second placement. And they called and said, I um, think I have another son for Joe. Is he looking to adopt again? <laughs> and it was just, and then I remember calling you and having that conversation and just sort of this organicness of it was it wasn't, you just were so open to what it was going to look like on any given day, which I, I think was incredible. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, this this falls into the whole concept of identity formation, right? <clears throat> we graduate from high school. We have a new identity. We go to we go to college. We have a new identity. We get married. We get divorced. We get a new job. We get fired. All of those things impact our identity formation, and that's always changing. Right. You you walk down the street, you have an accident, your identity changes. Like you know, you break your leg, you become a victim. That changes your identity. All of our life is just a series of movements towards us figuring out where we who we are. Right? I'm getting older. Like, who am I now? <laughs> like I can't run up, you know, I went to Puerto Rico, I ran up a jetty, I fell down and they like tore my ACL. Who am I now? I'm not, the, I'm certainly not the person I thought I was as I ran up that jetty. <laughs> and I, and I had experience, I took me a while to even accept that I was not that person anymore and have to sort of accept that, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. So, you know, yeah. So when I, when I, and again, I always go back to identity formation, but our identities, everybody's identity is forever changing. You have children, you have grandchildren, you know, it changes, it changes and you have to sort of move with it. I love that. You also talk about the, the, the teacher who made you feel seen. I wanted to ask like, what, what, like what actions did that teacher take? Well, we're, that's like, that's going to be a whole other section of the of the podcast. But in in essence, when when I when I finally told him this is well after I've graduated from college, even some of the things that I was experiencing while under his charge, I think he summed it up. You know, with tears in his eyes, he said, "I only treated you like you should have been treated," mm -hmm. and. That I think answers that question. He treated me like everybody else. And that, and then not only did he see me, but I had to be able to see that, right? And because that connection was made, then a lot of things opened up. A lot of opportunities opened up for me. He wasn't doing it because he felt sorry for me or because I was in foster care. He was just seeing who I was. And that's got to be such a foreign feeling. You know, I, whenever I watched Bastard and I listen and, and 
the number is always impactful to me of how many kids are in foster care and and just all the other dynamics that go into it and and being in that field for so long and watching youth struggle about who they are, what they are, questioning what family looks like and being that person that they're trying to process all this with. You know, my history, I I I I had a family, but there was times that I probably should have been put in foster care. You know, I just I really, really struggled growing up in my family. And from the time I was so young, it was always I wanted to help. I would always wanted to help kids. I always wanted to help that person that that had that feeling because I knew this is what family was not supposed to feel like because I saw my friends and I saw different people and I, I went to their homes and saw what families kind of looked like for me and that love and, and all the things that went with it. So I had this unique connection with youth that I worked with in foster care of, and I, I say this so often as being that one person saw them for who they were, what they were, and not all of the external things that they felt were defining them which was has been a great, great journey for me and insightful for me. But when I think about who I am and yeah, I'm a mom, but I've always been this advocate and this fighter for what's right for our youth and, and what's good for them and, and just guiding them and, and coming up against a system that is so broken but I was so determined. So I think when people ask like, oh, when I walked into a room, they're, they're like, oh, there's Damon. She's going to have something to say about this, you know, because I did. And I was that voice and I was that loud person that said no and, and fought this broken system. And yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a big, I just get a pit in my stomach when I, I think of the numbers and the youth and, and their travels through this journey and wanting them to have that person and wanting them to have that family or connection because it's honestly that simple is that it does just take that one person. And yeah. why does that seem so hard in this broken system to have that happen? There's, there's no mystery at least on my end of why the four of us are sitting here on the screen together. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a connection that we all have to, this is this, I, you know, at least I'm, I'm I was going to say, I'm speaking for myself, but no, I'm not, I'm speaking for all of us. We want to help. <laughs> we want to do something to that makes people feel better. And sort of that empathy that you're talking about, that sensitivity, the, our vision, we see things that other people don't see because of our life experience. We can read kids in, in distress, right? We can read disingenuous caseworkers, right? We see the things probably, and I say this all the time, the little boy that I, that I was is the person who informs me the most. Because Indeed. as an adult, if I have my adult mind on, I may not see some things, but he's tugging on my shirt saying, look a little closer. And I, and I don't want to get rid of that, that vision, that ability. And if I dare so, that superpower. Again, I, I hate to think like this because again, the numbers are staggering when I watch that and, and this idea, but it, it continues to be of like, you know, you, you think about that coach or that teacher and like, they're, they're just kind, like they choose kindness over all else, right? They don't choose anything other than it's to be kind and, and to be authentic, right? To be who he was. He was a great teacher to everyone, mm -hmm. a great coach to everyone, but that had a greater impact on you because of your needs. He didn't specifically right. become a great coach to you, right? He he just was. And and I feel like sometimes people get caught up in in just and you know, 
Renee, I don't know you that well, but even the things that you say is that in every interaction, you just walked in and you were Renee. You were unapologetically who you were. And and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, didn't matter the circumstance. You walked in and you were yourself. And I think that's a really powerful thing. And I think, you know, when I see Guillermo, I see the like fledgling stages of someone who's finding out who he is and is walking into a space and being genuinely who he is in a space. And I, I think that's, you know, and not apologizing for it, that who you are as a human being and the feelings and experiences that you've had are are just what they are. And I don't need to apologize. I need, don't need to amend it. And it's brought me to where I am now. And, and that's the cool part, right? And I think if more people just were genuinely who they are and didn't worry about what does the agency think or what does this person think or what's the judge going to say or what's all these things and and I even think back to the thing we did when Guillermo shared about that foster mom who said well do you want to stay she wasn't worried about what anybody thought it was just oh, I signed up to be this kid's parent why would he move like she just was genuinely who she was and just this power in, I might not know who my identity is, but I'm going to walk into every space and be kind and do what's right. That That's like pretty powerful. And and why don't we do that more? Why, why aren't more people doing that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm excited for you, Guillermo, because this may not be that space. You may be a engineer. You might be an architect. You might be, so, you know, your identity has has i think a greater possibility of changing and morphing into something you know that's comfortable for you but yeah that that's that is you know the first time that we met it was just so genuine that was what drew me to to like ask you to be part of this in any way shape or form you're just genuine thank you so much for those kind words seriously are you making me both blush no, but uh, yeah, I, I think, I think Joe, I, well, all you guys, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys kind of understand that in foster care, a lot of the time we have to just kind of like close in, make ourselves kind of small, right? And we have to shift our, our identity, right? We have to play those characters, no matter whether it be this character of being tough when you're walking into a blue club, getting sidestopped, right? Or to, to a foster parent, you know, acting like an angel so that they don't kick you out. Right. I think, I think, I think I am, I am taking, I'm, I'm taking those steps slowly taking them, but I'm, I, I do believe I'm taking those steps to just be my genuine self. And, you know, one, one big thing about me being my genuine self, I have to be around other genuine people for me to actually, you know what I mean? Like I can't, if, if, if somebody's faking, it's like, you know what? We're playing a game here. Like I feel like, let me play my character too, you know? So yeah, I, that, that's, I have to say that you all are incredibly genuine. And honestly, I see it as like lessons for, for myself. You've been listening to Out of the Starting Blocks and Into the Race. We want to thank you for joining us. And we want to thank our guests for helping us out today. Check out joetools.com and look for your opportunity to have a voice in our backstage discussions where we continue to discuss our important topics. Remember to look for updates at joetools.com where you can book a speaking engagement and get in touch with the hosts.